Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in. It's David Summers. It's another stud cast. Here we go with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It is the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. So now we step back into the ring, back into time. We're going to get wall to wall and treetop tall. He's the Tennessee stud. Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. So happy Valentine's Day, Ron. Oh, thank you very much, man. You know, uh, I don't I didn't send you anything, no flowers or anything, Dave. I hope that's all right, man. I promise I'm not disappointed. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, man, uh, you know, we got pretty good weather up here today. It's, uh, it's actually good to close to 70 degrees, so wow. Uh, we've been in the thirties and, uh, so the seventies are going to feel good, man. The late high sixties, uh, and, um, got a little snow in the mountains up there. Wow. So, wow. You know, it's, uh, it, it looks like, uh, it looks like, uh, we're out West somewhere, <laughs> man, rather than where we are in the East. That's awesome. Hey. And so after the Super Bowl, it seems like somebody flipped a switch because we're in the like 75 here today in Southeast Alabama. And so maybe, and I, whether the groundhog saw its shadow or not, doesn't seem to matter here. So we're just going to keep moving on and and see what happens with this weather. And we'll take it like it is any day on a day like this. Hey, listen, these stud casts, Ron, they're definitely on fire. It seems like every one of them now sets a new download record. No kidding. After seeing the title for this one, number 287, I have no doubt another record is going to be broken. It's simply called Harley's Four Days. So why do you think, I think I know, but why do you think Harley Race was so popular and so respected by so many wrestling fans, not just in our area, but around the entire world, Stud? Well, man, uh, to me, Harley was the NWA's common man world champion. Uh, you know, uh, Harley Leland Race, and I asked him one time what his middle name was, uh, Leland, the man. It's a kind of a different one. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Harley was not a particularly handsome man. You know, he, he wasn't a, a body full of muscles like a lot of wrestlers are. Uh, he wasn't the absolute most eloquent on the microphone. Uh, he wasn't a high flyer, and he sure wasn't a bullshit buyer. You know, he didn't take much of that. So, uh, you know, and he was just as tough as nails, man. He looked like he was. He spoke like it, and by gosh, he could definitely prove it if he needed to. So, uh, since we're on this subject about Harley's uh, toughness, Dave, we kind of started out that way. So, uh, you know, uh, I want to start this studcast with a little Harley race story, man. Uh, something I think very few fans may know about Harley. Hmm. Okay. All right. So, you know, Harley was born in Missouri, uh, you know, and then he died there as well, you know, uh, but, uh, he was, <laughs> he was the type of guy that, and he told me a lot of stories. He knocked out his school principal. Whoa. <laughs> he got an altercation with his school principal and just knocked him out. Wow. Uh, so he, he had to quit school, basically, because they weren't going to let him back in anyway. And then he went to work on a farm that was owned, uh, man, oddly enough, wow, what, what history is all about, but by a, uh, a 20th century wrestling star, man, uh, Stanless Zabisco. And uh, so Zabisco 
had a big farm there in Missouri, and Harley went to work for him. And Zabisco observed Harley's toughness. Well, you know, and obviously uh, you knock out your high school principal in the 10th grade or whatever it is, you know. Uh, I guess that's what you call it. Or mm-hmm. maybe not too bright. But uh, anyway, uh, so Zabisco trained him, man, and, uh, to be a wrestler. And, and he obviously, back in those days, he taught him to, to a little bit of shooting, too, which was very important if you're going to be a world champion. So Harley told me on one of the first Territories. He told me this story, and uh, one of the when I one of the first times I sat and worked with him, had any time to spend with him, and he told me that one of the first territories he ever wrestled in was my grandfather's Roy's nearby Tennessee territory, basically across the Mississippi River, mm-hmm. you know. And he told me how much he and I admired my grandfather as a territory owner and as a tough guy too, and and he said. Uh, you know, it was where he met his first wife. And uh, so he'd been working there for several months, uh, basically to hone his skills. And, uh, you know, he was just getting started. And uh, he and his, his and his first wife got married. And, uh, and they were there about a month uh, after she got pregnant before they went home to Missouri. Uh, and he went back to Missouri to wrestle for one of his best friends, Gus Karras, who was a guy that owned the territory in Missouri. Hmm. So... Uh, so not not far from their home, after they left Nashville, they had a horrible car wreck, man, just to go on the uh, Missouri side of the river. And his wife and uh, their unborn child and him, he too, were all pronounced dead at the scene. Wow. This is a true story. Uh, and, yeah. Wow. So – they put them in ambulances and they started to take them back to the funeral home. And on the way back to the funeral home, he suddenly started to show signs of life. Right. But his arm and both his legs were just mangled. They severely, he was tore up big time. So instead of taking him to the funeral home, they took him to a hospital naturally. And then, uh, you know, he was out for a couple of days unconscious. And uh, then when he regained consciousness, first doctor that came to see him, he says, uh, sat down on on a little chair beside him and you know, and, and uh, Harley says, oh, where's my wife? And he says, you don't have a wife anymore. It was, you know, pretty a nasty way of putting it, right? And uh, and then he says, and also he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, it looks like to me, man, that we're going to have to uh, amputate your right leg. You're going to lose your right leg. Whoa. And uh, so – Gus Karras, now he knew Hardy was coming home, and Harley didn't arrive back home, so Gus got to looking for him, and he finally tracked him down. And, he, and when he got there, uh, he went into the hospital, and he asked for Harley, and they said, oh, he's in surgery, he's at the such and such room, and uh, whatever. And uh, they'd already sedated him, and uh, they were about to take his right leg off. Mm. And... Uh, he said that uh, Gus Karras came busting through the door into the operating room, found out the day they're going to take his leg off, and uh, and he he just stopped the surgery. He says, heck, no, you are not cutting his leg off. He wow. said, this guy's a tough son of a gun. And, uh, he'll, and the doctor said, he'll never walk again. He says, he'll, he'll not only walk, he'll wrestle again, by God. And, uh, you know, Karras was a real tough son of a gun himself, right? Mm. So anyway... Uh, Gus finally got him out of the hospital there, and, and he, he spent two years finding the best doctors and the best therapists around wow. that could save Harley's leg for him, okay? Wow. And plus, he had a real bad arm. He had pins and stuff all put in his arms and his knees and his legs. And, you know, he was, he was you know, and, and most people would have never walked again, basically. Mm. Yeah. You know, two years later, he was in the ring again. And uh, so... Uh, you know, and when they told me this story, I said, so, Harley, if Gus Karras had been five minutes later, you would have never had the career you've had. Right. Right. That's no. a, that's that's an amazing story, Ryan. I know you've mentioned before on the studcast that Harley almost lost his leg. I never knew the details that you just gave. So. Obviously, that makes us an even bigger Harley Rays fan. It's hard to imagine 
the fans lost if they never had the opportunity to see the greatest of all time, in my opinion, wrestle. So that's a great way to start this stud cast. So where do we ride to first? Well, we're going to spend a great deal of time today in this one uh, talking about four Southeastern events. All of those were headlined by the NWA world champion, Harley Race. They were in a four straight night period. He had four different opponents in this, uh, it, and they were all between uh, the date, uh, Sunday, February 18th. Uh, he was going to be there through Wednesday, February 21st, and this was in 1979. It's this time frame that we've been talking about for quite a while now. We're just now getting into it, and uh, so, so uh, let's, you know, we're going to talk about the Sunday match, February 18th. Pensacola, Florida, in their municipal auditorium. The Monday match, we, he went back to Tennessee. It was at February 19th. Uh, he wrestled in the Civic Coliseum in Knoxville. On Tuesday, he went south again to Montgomery in the Civic Center in Montgomery on February 20th. And then he finished up on Wednesday night, February 21st, in that big, beautiful Mobile Municipal Auditorium, the big building. So uh, we're going to go into great detail, man, and we're going to focus on these four shows, the TVs that promoted them, the results of the matches. We're going to talk about the attendances in the four. We're going to talk about the gross houses of the four Mm -hmm. events, and we're going to talk about Harley's payoff for four straight events in Southeastern 1979. <laughs> so, so hopefully, uh, you know, we get all that done. We, we're going to have some time for a learning tree question, too, to finish this off today, man. All right. We'll see if we can get to that one. That's a, and, and listen, a great one that you've got lined up for us today, Stad. That is awesome. So something for everybody. There's no doubt. I personally love hearing the attendances, the gross houses, and the payoffs of the champion. I've heard you tell stories about meeting with Harley in private when everybody's gone it's just you and the man and you paying him off i think man those are some cool stories all right so where do we ride first well let's start on harley's first night man uh it was his first time ever in pensacola florida uh which was down in the southeastern gulf coast naturally and uh we're gonna ride with him and make the next three nights trips from florida we're going to go 500 miles north to Knoxville, and we're going to go back south to Montgomery, and we'll finish up uh, down there on the Gulf Coast, man, in the biggest building of them all in Mobile, Alabama. Okay, so I'm already excited about this one, Stud. I love that white beach, those sugar white sands in Pensacola, Florida. So tell us who is on the card, the first card, in that historic Pensacola Municipal Auditorium that sat on Pensacola Bay. So what was that like? Well, the first match was uh, the first wrestler, uh, uh, the new booker, Louis Tillette, uh, who had just tired down there, the first guy that he had recruited. And uh, that guy was a former University of Oklahoma amateur star, Herb Calvert. And it was his first match in Pensacola. And he, he got everybody's attention coming down to the ring to make his first Pensacola uh, challenge. Uh, and he challenged anybody in the building that'd like to take a shot at winning his five one hundred dollar bills, which he had in his hand, and uh, and all they had to do was come down and beat him, you know. Uh, and the uh, great thing about it, there was a challenger that night, you know. Sometimes when he did these challenges, there was no challenger, but there was a challenger on this night, and uh, you know, big crowd obviously. We got a tremendous card, so. Uh, so we're going to talk about the results of this later, but uh, we want to cover all the different matches. So after that challenge, uh, he has a, a an advertised match with Buzz Sawyer. And uh, he, he was uh, obviously, uh, it was his first match with Herb Calvert. And uh, Buzz Sawyer, pretty tough guy too. Next match was a special event. Don Carson and the Assassin, managed by Billy Spears, wrestled the first recruited team by Booker. Louis Tillette, one that had been a very popular tag team in that area for many years. You'll probably recognize both these names, Dave, Ricky Fields and Terry Latham. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No doubt. Great team. Uh, Next match uh, was for the Southeastern Tag Championship. Jimmy Golden and Norville Austin, they were the Southeastern Tag Champions, were facing off well, against another team there that was compliments to Louis Tillet. And this team was actually from Pensacola and uh, close relatives of Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. 
man. These were the big old Polynesian dudes named Afa and Sika, mm -hmm. and they were called the Samoans. <laughs> yeah. So, wow, you know, uh, this, they got the, you got the, these young boys, uh, Jimmy and them, going up against some, some bad son of a guns. Then in the Southern Championship match, uh, I, I'd, uh, been, I was defending the newly won belt that I'd won in Memphis the week before, and I was going to defend it against the former NWA world champion, Terry Funk. Wow, that is legendary. Are you kidding? I mean, all the way from Texas, Funk was on that card? He certainly was, man. And, and another great championship match followed us. David Schultz wearing for the first time the Southeastern belt. He had just won it from Tony Charles the week before, was defending it against Bob Armstrong. And the last match was for the NWA World Championship. Harley Race was defending in an extremely rare international match against one of England's best, Tony Charles. Now, to me, that's got to be one of the best cards I've ever heard. Two NWA champions, four championship matches. You were going all out on this one, Stud. So how do you handle the TV for this particular night since you already you already uh, another big world title card coming up in Mobile already scheduled just three days later? Well, that's a great question. You know, <laughs> it, it takes some thought here. Uh, but before we get to the TV show, let's have a quick discussion about the ticket prices for these four excellent cards. Talk about the very important decision, man, of what to charge for this type of an event. It, it is a big card, man, as good as they get, probably. And Knoxville had these uh, three car types of cards before. But the three southeastern Gulf Coast cities that's getting these championship matches, they've never seen anything like this. You know, cards that had two warm, two former world champions, or one present one and one former woman, one former one, and so all three of these Gulf Coast cities for the first time are going to have a world title match. So we had these Golden Circuit ringside tickets uh, in Knoxville before. Uh, so we thought about it. I, I had to make the decision of what we're going to do with ticket prices. So the first three rows around the ring would go from the normal $5 a ticket uh, to $10. And all of the other seats in the building would be raised just $1 per seat. So if you're going to sit in the first three rows of ringside, which is basically called the Golden Circle, you paid a little more money, but, uh, wow, you got primo seat. Yeah. So let's get to your TV question, okay? So the Mobile and Pensacola TV markets were the only one in both territories, in southeastern Knoxville or the Gulf Coast, that had two world championship matches to advertise on the same show. Those cities, Mobile and Pensacola, were both in that Mobile TV market. So uh, plans were made for the TVs in both the territories uh, to utilize the personality profiles. To advertise, the, you, they, the profile would advertise the special ticket prices for these four events. And it would also include a two-minute personalized interview from Harley Race, about the opponent he would be facing, and then a second two-minute interview from that opponent. So, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate, man, with having some some arm twisting, man. <laughs> I had been very fortunate to have a little arm twisting with Harley and Terry Funk. Uh, uh, that, uh, And I got them both, man, to be on the Southeastern TV shows. Uh, Terry Funk, going to be on the Knoxville show. Harley's <laughs> going to be on the Southeastern show down South for the first time ever, man. So, uh, and uh, those went obviously the Southeastern ones into three markets. Uh, the ones up North in Knoxville went into four different markets. But, uh, and then I was, smart. I was even lucky enough. I got Terry Funk to wrestle on, on TV in Knoxville. <laughs> right. All right. So what kind of arm tw twisting did you have to do? And why was it so important? Well, man, uh, arm twisting was done with uh, with the green from my pocket, man. <laughs> you know? And actually, my good luck, you know, <laughs> because uh, neither of those two guys happened to be working on that Saturday night when the TVs were recorded. So uh, why it was so important that you ask? Uh, well, having them live was priceless, man. But, you know, there's, a, there's an even better, for, <laughs> better reason for it, Dave, than that is it was the third week in February, the TV rating period. And I was going to have two NWA world champions <laughs> seen live on my show to the, 
accepted for the Arbitron and Nielsen rating book period, man. So uh, uh, it was really, you know, I was betting on some huge numbers in the February rating book in 1979. Mm -hmm. I should have known. You were really kicking some butt on that Saturday. So I can't wait to hear about those numbers about a month later, of course. All right. So where do we ride from here? Well, let's give everybody the, the results of the first card in Pensacola. Uh, there was so much going on in this card, man, that uh, we were focused directly uh, toward the future there because we had guys leaving, the guys that uh, we were trying to bring guys in. So all of it was, wow, luckily built around a fantastic night that was going to have a huge crowd. And uh, we were recording several matches in these upcoming uh, Gulf, Coast, Gulf Coast cards to get new people uh over as soon as possible. You know, we recorded a lot of matches in these three nights that we were down there in the Gulf Coast. Uh, the new booker, Louis Tillette, he was ecstatic with what was happening. Uh, so Herb Calvert, in that first match, uh, he pinned his first spectator from a Pensacola crowd. He had a guy that accepted the challenge, came down, and uh, and then uh, when he pinned this guy, which that probably went, uh, I watched the match, it might only go in five, six minutes at the most. <laughs> Uh, he pinned this guy, and uh, and then uh, Buzz Sawyer, man, <laughs> came, came down to the ring, uh, and he he got to witness him uh, do the little deal with uh, somebody from the audience, and that was pretty. Uh, it was pretty uh, strong for a uh, for talent man that had not uh, been shooters. Buzz wasn't a shooter, but he was a tough little son of a gun. So uh, you know, Buzz was going to be uh, leaving. To go to Memphis pretty quickly here at this point. And uh, so uh, uh, he got beat with a shooting move. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Calvert beat him with the old sugar hole, man, which uh, most fans had never seen anything like that. Mm. Then Ricky Fields and Terry Latham, they got themselves, you know, a, a really huge, 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 a totally unexpected win. Over the established, they were wrestling the established team of Don Carson and the Assassin, managed by Billy Spears. And uh, Carson and the Assassin were also on their way to Memphis pretty quick. So, you know, the, we had, we're trying to get these new talent, new people over as fast as we can. Then the Southeastern Tag Champions, Jimmy Golden, Norvell Austin, won by disqualification over the big, huge, huge Samoan team by Afon Sika. Uh, both those Samoans, man. Weighed over 300 pounds easily. Uh, Jimmy Golden had to be helped back to the dressing room. Uh, Jimmy had a pretty tough night of it. And uh, Jimmy was soon going to be headed to Memphis. And the uh, Samoans are down the line are going to become the new Southeastern Tag Team Champions in the future. Uh, wow, those boys were pretty spectacular. And then I successfully defended my Southern belt uh, with a fuller leg lock win over Terry Funk and uh, – well, we had a great match toward the house down. Uh, Terry was at his very best, man. He, he was so good back in those days. I needed a big win because I was going to be in southeastern Gulf Coast a lot, kind of there to hold things together, uh, all this talent's moving out, uh, and to replace the uh, new top talent with other talent until we got some other stars over. So, you know, it was good for me to get a good win over somebody with a big name. David Schultz got a big win over Bob Armstrong in the Southeastern Championship match. Schultz was going to be staying, and he was going to hold that belt for a while. And Bob was going to be in and out of Gulf Coast when needed, but he was still basically a Knoxville guy. The NWA world title match between Harley Race and Tony Charles was tremendous. Wow. I had never seen Harley take some of the – throws that Tony Charles put on him, man. Tony had all these moves from Europe, European moves. And I don't think Harley had seen a lot of them either, you know, but uh, Harley got a big win right in the middle. And, uh, and, and the way he did it, man, it tore the crowd up. Uh, the crowd just, uh, they were aghast, man, when he dived off the top rope and he hit Tony Charles, who was laying on the mat head to head with a, that his spectacular diving head butt fell off the top rope. <laughs> wow. All in all, it was a magnificent night for professional wrestling in Pensacola. Oh, it definitely sounds like I, I can only imagine, Ron. All right, so this has been outstanding so far, and we're only getting started. How about the attendance? 
Well, let's kind of save the attendances for the end of the stud cast. That way I can do them all together, man. And, uh, and I think it'll have even more impact that way. So, so, so why don't we ride north, man? Let's, 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 and, and let's set up the second event in Knoxville on Monday night, February 19th, 1979. Uh, Charlie Cook uh, opened the card up that night against Butch Malone. Ron Wright wrestled in the second match against Ted Allen. And there was a special six-man tag, the great Malenko, Crusher Blackwell, and Tora Tanaka against Kevin Sullivan, Ken Lucas, and Terry Gibbs. Uh, then there was a return Southeastern tag title match on the card because they'd had a controversial end in the week before in last week's stud cast. We talked about the Southeastern tag team tournament, Bob Roop and Bob and Bob Orton Jr. ended up in the ring against Bob Armstrong, Dick Slater on the end. And uh, so they came back to wrestle each other again because uh, Roop and Orton ended up winning that one by disqualification. So then the next match, I was defending my Southern heavyweight belt again against Terry Funk. And then the NWA world champion Harley Race on this night is going up against the Southeastern Knoxville champion and favorite, Ronnie Garvin. Wow. And now that's a fabulous card. You've already told us a lot about the TV to promote this card. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, nothing other than in addition to the live match with Terry Funk, where we got a win, uh, you know, with his uh, spinning toe hold. Uh, Bob Armstrong, Dick Slater got a good win also in that on that card. Malenko, Blackwell, and Tanaka won a six-man tag uh, on TV. Uh, Blackwell was uh, doing most of the work, as usual. And, uh, and then Ronnie Garvin closed out that show with uh, – with the uh, TV lights, man, uh, jumping, he went up into the lights again where you couldn't see him. And uh, I, I was in the south, so I didn't actually hear it. But Les told me he disappeared in the lights again, came down, lay in the guy's throat, and uh, he knocked another one out. And uh, he was ready for ready for his shot. Wow. So uh, one other thing, Dave, that was kind of a downer, man. Mm-hmm. We've been having these great run of crowds on Sunday afternoons for six straight weeks. We had every Sunday afternoon in the Coliseum, but this big world title card had to be moved to a Monday because they had a conflict in the building. They had an event that had been booked there for years, mm-hmm. and I, and I had no idea, man, how that was going to affect this Monday night crowd. You know, being uh, that it wasn't on a Sunday, but uh, that was the only thing that was a downer at all for for the, these events so far. I think in the past I've heard you say a number of times how it always hurt when you had to change your normal night. So tell us what happened on Monday, February 19th, 1979, in the Knoxville Coliseum. Well, Charlie Cook uh, beat Butch Malone. Uh, Ron Wright got a win over Ted Allen. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, Ken Lucas, and Terry Gibbs got a win over the great Malenko, Tor Tanaka, and Crusher Blackwell. But they got it in a very odd way. Uh, Malenko got into it uh, a little bit with Blackwell and just started slapping Blackwell all around, you know, and they'd, they'd been doing this. Him, uh, Orton, uh, Root, uh, those guys were really taking advantage of big old Blackwell. And uh, Malenko got into the slap of Blackwell so bad uh, that uh, he turned his back on Kevin Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan schoolboyed him and beat him. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> So you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great night for Malenko. It wasn't a good way to lose, but uh, you know, Black, Blackwell was probably happy to see it happen that way. So the next match was with a wrestler that had captivated the Knoxville crowd for years. Man, uh, Terry Funk pulled uh, that giant curtain back at the rear of the Coliseum like he had done so many times before, and he slowly made that long walk to the ring, man. Uh, to wrestle me, man. That crowd was going crazy. By the time he got to the ring, he had everybody <laughs> standing up, and he had done nothing but walk to the ring. Wow. <laughs> no, that he had a he just had it, man. So, you know, and and they hated him there. He had such heat there. So we had probably me and Terry at least ten matches 
since that NWA world title match we had in 1976 that ended with me getting my hand raised and the decision being changed and taking the belt back from me, Ronnie Garvin coming to the ring, jumping off the top rope of my throat, uh, me being put on a stretcher and passed up through the crowd and sent to the hospital a wild night. But those fans had never forgotten it, man, that match. And, uh, and so I got a chance to make them happy that night. I beat Terry Funk right in the middle of the ring with my fuller leg lock. Uh, 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 uh. So then uh, Ronnie Garvin and Harley Race gave the crowd everything an NWA world title match should be. Wow. It was, I got an opportunity to watch it. It was really, really amazing. And, uh, and it was so good that there was a ride on the end of it. Because the referee got knocked down. Uh, Garvin, when the referee was down, jumped off the top rope in Harley's throat and covered him. But there's no referee to count Harley out. The great Malenko came to the ring. He had his Russian chain. Garvin was laying on top of uh, the champion. And uh, Malenko slammed that chain across the back of Ronnie's head. Then he just turned Ronnie over, put Harley on top of him, and he got out of the ring. Uh, so referee, uh, rolled over, uh, Harley's on top. He got the pin and, uh, and he raised his hand. Malenko was trying to leave, but wow. When that happened, th- there was no place to go. <laughs> they had him trapped and, you know, so, uh, so he, so, uh, Harley rolled out with him. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were surrounded by a mob of fans, man, that attacked both of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. All right. That had to really been wild. So, did I mean, did anybody get hurt? Well, not that I'm aware of, but both Malenko and Harley, man, they had to take, we had an emergency heel exit, man, that took them straight to the dressing room. For situations like this, because we that wasn't the first type of ride that we'd had there. So, uh, they instead of going to the back of the Coliseum, which really gave them a long way to have to fight their way to get to, they went straight from the ring right straight across to into this a little entrance into the dressing room, directly into the dressing room. But when they started that process, they were guarded by, it looked like 20 cops around them, <laughs> keep fighting people <laughs> off of them. Uh, it was a bad scene. It was a bad scene, but wow, it was a, another tremendous night for fans. All right. So this is, this is getting really good stud. And a perfect spot for our break, so I think we'll do that. It's been a wonderful first half. When we come back, we have two more huge events to talk about, plus the numbers for all four attendances, the gross house receipts, and the champion's payoffs. That is coming up when this studcast continues right here. Hey, I tell you what, Ron, on the break today, why don't you jump in here with me and let's talk about your new Ask the Stud that's going to be happening this coming Saturday, February 18th, 2023, and it's happening on YouTube, Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. So tell us if we want to get in on this, tell us what we do on Ask the Stud. This is like the second volume, right? Right. This is the second one, Dave. And uh, wow, the first one was just spectacular. I have huge numbers. I mean, I've, I've been amazed with it. Uh, but it's a great, great uh, question and answer show. The questions were absolutely phenomenal. And this second one is just as good. The questions are really, really great. And uh, I really enjoyed these doing these question and answer shows. Uh, that, on my f- uh, social media sites and my Facebook uh, sites and on Twitter, uh, I, I'll, run, uh, I'll, I'll run the ad uh, uh, publicizing again. And I always leave you an area down there at the end of it. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask, you can put it right there on those Facebook uh, sites or the Twitter. Uh, just make a reply there. Uh, leave your name, obviously, and uh, the city that you live in. Mm-hmm. And uh, just uh, ask any question that you like. And and I'm really, really enjoying these. Uh, this is an exclusive YouTube uh, YouTube thing. Uh, it's, it's a Southeastern rewind. You go Southeastern rewind on YouTube. Uh, you're going to be able to see this one. It's going to come on, uh, that we'll get trying to set it up for noon release on noon Saturday, this coming Saturday, which is a February the 18th. And, uh, I'd like, uh, you know, everybody to give it a listen. Uh, if you like these type of shows, 
this one will be a great one. I can guarantee you that. The first one was really, really good. I've had so many, many wonderful comments about it. And uh, I look forward to it. I like them. And, uh, and you, I've got questions, man, that I can't imagine. Uh, <laughs> and they're not just from this country. Uh, so, you know, the, it's right. pretty amazing how many people are listening to us all over the world. So whoever can reach you on your social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, but do you what kind of limit do you put on it? How long is it and how many questions might you allow? Well, I mean, uh, you know, they can ask any question. The length of the question is done. It doesn't make any difference with that. I'm going to answer just about as many as I can in an hour's length of time. And uh, and I'm going to do this. This is going to be once a month, every third Saturday in the month, I'm cool, going to do cool. them. Okay. So, uh, fans will be able to, uh, to hear, hear these, uh, every month. And, uh, this second one I'm really looking forward to. And, uh, I want to thank everybody for all of your support on the first one, your great questions from the first one. And, uh, Let's just uh, knock this one in, this second one out of the park, just like we did the first one. Oh, no doubt that's going to happen this Saturday. Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. All right, welcome back. Studcast number 287, Harley's Four Days. We are right in the middle of it. So where do we ride now, Stud? Well, we're headed south again, man. We're going back to southeastern Gulf Coast. This time we're going to Montgomery, Alabama for Harley's third defense in three nights. Uh, he had won both of the first two, and he had two more nights left, man. So uh, this night, uh, we're talking about Montgomery here. Uh, so on this night, Herb Calvert, again, uh, uh, went to the ring uh, for his challenge. He challenged anybody in the crowd that uh, you know wanted to try him for the $500 prize. He showed the, the fans the five $100 bills and uh, – and he announced that, you know, anybody could win it. All they had to do, if they had guts enough to come down and beat him, they'd, they'd get to me, give him the money. Uh, but no one took him up on the challenge on this night, okay? So Bud Scott, Sawyer, he came running down to the ring, you know, and uh, and he grabbed the microphone. He said, uh, wait, wait, you do got a challenger here, man. He said, I'm going to challenge you for your $500, right? So then Calvert Kind of explain to him, you know, that uh, what the challenge was about, that it was for the fans and the audience only, man. It ain't for you, you know, he said. And, and he was still holding the $500, uh, you know, and the Sawyer's in his face. And so Sawyer just knocks him on the ground and starts trying to get his money. <laughs> so referee rang the bell, and uh, the first match is off to a wild start, man. And so, uh, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, they got back, uh, it didn't take long to, uh, you know, uh, to finish giving everybody, man, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the end of this match, man. It's pretty good, uh, at the end of the card, uh, but uh, let's just go through the, uh, the rest of the card. Okay. Right. okay. So okay. the next match was, this was kind of like a David and Goliath battle. The second match. Uh, you had the two huge 300 plus pound Samoans against that young team that had all that history in Montgomery. Uh, the much smaller Ricky Fields and Terry Latham. They were probably almost twice as big as, as uh, Fields and Latham. And uh, so uh, then uh, the next match after that, uh, it really, man, gonna, it was going to light up the Civic Center, man. Bob Armstrong took on the crazy Texan man, uh, the, the NWA, former NWA champion, uh, Terry Funk. Then uh, there were three championship matches after that match. The Southeastern Tag Champions, Jimmy Golden, Norvell Austin, defended against the former champions, Don Carson and the Assassin, managed by Billy Spears. Then the Southeastern Championship was on the line uh, with its new champion, David Schultz, defending against the former champion, Tony Charles. And then the last match was for the NWA World Championship, Harley Race against me for the 10 pounds of gold. Okay, that, Ron, is another fantastic card. So we know what was on the TV. You went through all of that earlier. You also gave us a small part of Buzz Sawyer attacking Herb Calvert for his money in the first match. So what else happened there? Well, after Sawyer got his hands on the money, you know, Calvert uh, soon – Soon, this uh, <laughs> Calvert was a pretty tough dude, man, and uh, so he just whipped him into a <laughs> into an old sugar hole there, man, 
put the sugar hold on him again. And uh, after Buzz submitted, Calvert just reached down, took his $500 and left Sawyer laying on the mat. Fans loved that one, man. It was a very short match, but, uh, you know, it got Calvert over. And it was one of his first nights there, and that's what you needed to do, man, to get guys going. And and I could see Herb Calvert was going to be something special down there in that southeastern area. And then a funny thing about it, Dave, uh, uh, Buzz was shooting for real trying to get that money. <laughs> and Calvert made him pay. <laughs> I've always heard that Buzz Sawyer was a tough wrestler. So it sounds like he picked on the wrong guy in this situation, but I'm pretty sure fans got a kick out of that match. Well, they did, Matt. And the next match after that, too, when Ricky Fields and Terry Latham, who, had, like I already said earlier, they were, they were former stars in that Montgomery area, been partners there many times. But they had never been up against two guys the size of these Samoans, man. And wow, did they get a huge pop when they came out with a win. So fans were like, these guys don't have a chance. And then they end up winning the match. Wow, it's a pretty good deal, man. I watched uh, all of these matches, which were wonderful. I had the opportunity all four of these nights to watch the matches. And they were all tremendous uh, but uh, then uh, after the, you know, uh, then they got a lot of pops, man, uh, in the next match. Bob Armstrong, uh, who was over in Montgomery, a big, big favorite there. And uh, him and Terry Funk, man, tore that building down. Bob got the biggest pop of the night so far when he put Terry to sleep, man. He wrapped them big old arms around his head and his neck. And uh, when Terry went to sleep and they raised his hand and it dropped three times and they rung the bell, oh, wow, that building went crazy. They, you know, they did not expect to see that big a victory. Then in the Southeastern Tag Championship match, uh, that just kept things going. Uh, Jimmy Golden and Norvell, the new champions, maintained their belts and they gave their – Gave the fans a fourth great match in a row on that card against Don Carson and the assassin who was managed by Billy Spears. And then there was another Southeastern Championship match. Uh, David Schultz already had a lot of heat before his match with Tony Charles. But, man, he really added to his heat in this match because he left Tony Charles laying and uh, Tony had to be carried away from the ring. Whoa. Tony was going to be leaving, too, going to, into the Memphis territory. Mm -hmm. So uh, these guys were really getting some big wins. Okay, so it was your time to go to the ring against maybe the best NWA champion of all time, Harley Race. So how did, how did you two do compared to the rest of the night? Well, you know... Uh, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to put the pressure on me today, Dave. You know? <laughs> the, the match is 44 years ago, man. <laughs> so after watching almost all of these great matches that night, I put the pre pressure on myself. You know, I mean, uh, I'm wrestling Harley Race, uh, biggest crowd ever in Montgomery. Uh, you know, it's like, wow, they didn't need any extra pressure. And uh, Harley and I did something that night that probably had never been done there before. And we wrestled, man, to an exhausting 60-minute time limit draw. Uh, thankfully, there was nobody sitting in their seats during the last 10 minutes of that hour. The match was tremendous. Wow. And the fans, in the last 10 minutes, we just, well, we gave it all to them, everything you had. Uh, Montgomery fans had probably never seen a match like that. It was one of those events that made wrestling fans forever. Uh, they go home talking about it, and they talk to all their friends and all their neighbors. Uh, wow, it was a phenomenal night. Another phenomenal night for wrestling in the Southeast. Oh, without a doubt, it sounds like an unforgettable evening of wrestling, but Harley had one more night to go. It was in Mobile, Alabama on February 21st, 1979. That's a Wednesday in the huge municipal auditorium. I've heard you say it was the biggest crowd, maybe the biggest crowd ever in Southeastern history, up to that point at least. Who was on that card, and how did it differ from the Pensacola card only 50 miles away? Well, that's a good question. You know, I mean, uh, you got two markets on the same TV. Uh, Pensacola's already had their world championship match. You, you had all the same wrestlers that had been on that Pensacola card 
on this same card, this world title match in Mobile. But only one of those six matches on the Mobile card had the same opponents that, that, that Pensacola had had. So the opening match started the same way in all three Gulf Coast events, basically. Uh, Herb Calvert uh, was, uh, came to the ring, and he challenged the crowd uh, for anybody that thought they could beat a wrestler to come get the money, showed the money in the whole deal. Uh, and this was Mobile, Dave. You know, a crazy market, crazy mm-hmm. people in Mobile. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't a darn bit surprised, but Calvert didn't have one challenger. He had two. Uh-oh. <laughs> So he set one down on the chair in the corner and he beat the one and then he beat the second one. And uh, then as soon as he beat the second one, his scheduled opponent, Buzz Sawyer, came down to the ring uh, for his match. Uh, next match on that card, Ricky Fields and Terry Latham didn't wrestle, you know, the, the Billy Spears team as they did in Pensacola. But this time they took on the Samoans. So it was Fields and Latham taking on the Samoans. Uh, that wasn't the same match that happened in Pensacola. Uh, it was great. It was a totally different match. If fans, a lot of fans drove from one city to another because it's only 50 miles. They wanted to see both of these events. Uh, then in the Southeastern Tag Championship match, Jimmy Golan, Norvell Lawson, they didn't wrestle against the Samoans like they had in Pensacola, but they defended against Carson and the Assassin, managed by Billy Spears. Terry Funk wrestled Tony Charles who had wrestled Harley in Pensacola. So that was a different match. In the Southeastern Championship match, David Schultz defended against me. And uh, Schultz had wrestled Bob Armstrong in Pensacola. So, um, you know, and uh, then Harley defended, man, his world title against Bob Armstrong. Wow, that's amazing. So you had six matches in Pensacola with all the same wrestlers as you had in Mobile three days later. Yet five of those six matches in Mobile had totally different opponents in them. So the two cities had almost completely different cards. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what bookers do, Dave. Sometimes <laughs> they make magic. <laughs> they make magic. So, all right, was there magic in the results of the Mobile matches? You know, the, just like it had been in the other three, basically, man, world title events, Dave. I mean, yeah, they, there was magic every night in every one of those cards. Uh, Calvert beat both of the spectators from the audience in less than five minutes. And then he duplicated his match from the night before in Montgomery when Buzz tried to take this $500. And uh, and Buzz got sugared again, man. <laughs> the sugar hold again. So uh, Fields and Latham, uh, they lost their tag match this time against the huge Samoans, Alpha and Sika. Uh, And Alpha and Sika were absolutely devastating in that tag match. Wow, they and how did they get over? And uh, and I looked over there in the in the the far dressing room, uh, you and I saw Billy Spears. He watched this whole match from the back of the building, man. And uh, and then as soon as it was over, he immediately ran to the ring before the Samoans could get out of the ring. And uh, and he turned on his charm, man. He did everything but kiss their butts in front of everybody, man. He even <laughs> held their hands up in victory. And then he followed them back to the dressing room like a little puppy dog. <laughs> <laughs> so then Jimmy Golden and Norville Lawson looked as strong as the Smoans, man. And their win over Carson and the Assassin uh, was managed by Spears. And Spears was only there <laughs> on that match. Uh, he got disgusted with how bad Carson and the Assassin were getting their butts beat that uh, he just went to the dressing room alone. He left them. He didn't even stay till the match was over and Golden and Austin got their win. Wow. So it appears that Billy Spears was at it again, I guess you would say. He only cared. Can you believe it? He only cared about himself. Sounds pretty obvious. He had, he had his eyes on a new team. All right. So who was next? Well, Terry Funk, man, did his magic in his match with Tony Charles, man. He beat Tony in the middle of the ring uh, with his uh, family's patented spinning toe hole. Uh, Tony was another star that I might have mentioned earlier. He was leaving and on his way to Memphis. So, And, man, I was always looking for any opportunity to use Terry Funk, who was, in my opinion, one of the most complete wrestlers in the business. He was just phenomenal. Uh, David Schultz and I, we had one of our first matches uh, against each other. 
Uh, in fact, I think it was the first match we ever had against each other on this card for the Southeastern Championship. And uh, for fans down there, they know that both he and I had started off uh, as, South e- as heels for, in Southeastern Gulf, o- Gulf Coast, which was just about almost exactly a year from the date of these matches that we're, and we're talking about today that we had opened that territory. And uh, and at this time now, I was a babyface, had been for a few months, but I had not had a chance to work with uh, David Schultz. And, uh, and David was, you know, I, I like to tell people this because uh, it's, a, it's kind of a great story, too. David Schultz was trained by my grandfather's brother, Herb Welch. And uh, Schultz, man, to me, was a natural heel. He could really get great heat, man, and he got it in this match. I ended up winning it, but but he got himself disqualified to save his belt. And even <laughs> the fact that he got disqualified got him great heat. I mean, it didn't make any difference. People just <laughs> hated him. They, they, you know, he had it. He yeah. just had that thing, man. And um, so, and David was committed to staying in the so- southeastern Gulf Coast. We had all these guys leaving. But I talked to him, and he says, no, Ron, I, I love it here. I'm staying here, man. And, uh, you know, it was a great deal. We needed great workers like David at this point, man. And it certainly didn't hurt that the fact that he was the champion. That made him want to stay a little more. And, uh, my gosh, we were really lucky to have him, man. He was a tremendous talent. And uh, and he goes on to, to, to become a Hall of Famer. Wow. Yeah. The NWA world title match that night between Bob Armstrong and Harley Race was off the charts. I mean, it was Harley's last night. Uh, he got his hand raised the first two nights. And in these last two, he was going Broadway. Okay. I've heard you use that word Broadway before. So what does that mean? Uh, is, I'm sure the context is different here. Well, it's, it's one of those kayfabe words that, you know, few people ever heard, and then they never knew what it meant if they did hear it, you know. So it basically, it simply meant that you were not going to have a finish in the match, that you were going to go, you were going to go Broadway, meaning you're going to wrestle all the way to the end of the time limit, and the bell is going to end the match. Um, right. Most wrestlers never experienced a one-hour Broadway match in their entire careers. Uh, mm-hmm. You had to be a star, kind of, uh, to be in a position that that people would sit through an hour match and like it. And uh, NWA World Champions, all of them, probably had more Broadways than any wrestlers on earth. If you were the NWA champion, you're going to get two or three, maybe even four of these a week. And if you weren't in great shape, there was always a chance that the match not, might not be the best, you know. Champion was in the best shape, but sometimes his opponents weren't able to do those hours. <laughs> but when you had a master man like Harley calling the match and you had a superior athlete like Bob Armstrong and the shape he was, Daddy, yeah. these Broadway matches were the most beautiful matches ever. I mean, they were unbelievable. And that night in Mobile, Alabama, and the night before in Montgomery when I wrestled him, Harley did back-to-back Broadways and left those fans in both of those buildings not only wanting more, but going away saying that they witnessed the best wrestling match of their lives. So that's what happened in Mobile that night and Montgomery the night before. Mm -hmm. A great Broadway match. Uh, was the best finish in the business because if you wanted to build your company and if you wanted to create create a great rivalry between the world champion and and some of your great baby faces they had to do these broadways they had to do these long matches and create that uh, that uh, real rivalry that uh, was going to make you big money yeah all right that's a great explanation of not just what happened those nights in mobile and montgomery in the NWA world title matches, but what you guys went through for the fans, no doubt. What a tremendous stud cast this has been. We're getting close to running out of time, stud. I don't think you can finish without telling us what the attendances, gross houses, and Harley's payoff was for these four tremendous NWA world title nights in February of 1979. 
Well, Dave, uh, you know, I wouldn't have promised that I was going to do this uh, if I didn't have the time to do it. And I, and I, I went to, and took the time to, to get the info together. You know, uh, there, we're talking a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, and I never realized until I did this just how strong Southeastern business was back in that day. So in these four days, uh, the, the matches in these four days, Pensacola was a total sellout, 5,100 fans. Uh, all four of them not only sold out, but they turned out of thousands of people away, uh, the four cities. Uh, Knoxville was a total sellout, 5,600 fans. Uh, Montgomery was a sellout of 5,000, and Mobile had 10,200 fans. Uh, the, so the total attendance in these four nights was 25,900 people. Uh, so <laughs> let, let's, let's break down the gross houses, you know. Uh, so we did we raised the prices. Mm -hmm. I told us, told, talked about that earlier in all of the buildings. So the average ticket price for this event was $7 a seat. You had 25,900 tickets sold at $7 a ticket. Uh, that produced a gross figure uh, when you add up all the four nights combined of $181,300 in four oh nights. God. In today's money, that would be $708,000 in four nights. Uh, then Harley's payoff for the trip. Mm -hmm. It was his last night. I had an opportunity to go to his dressing room, and I always loved to do it. Wow. You know, and uh, and I had seen his eyes light up before, but never like this, man. Mm -hmm. Harley made $18,000 that night. Uh, in today's money, that would have been $79,000 for four matches. Holy cow. All right, so was he expecting that amount, or was did was there a figure that he had expected because of four days and stayed with your company for that period of time? I never knew what he was expecting, you know. Uh, but you knew uh, he was happy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> gosh. He was blown away. He was blown away. I mean, uh, I thought he was never going to turn me loose when I hugged him at the end of the night. Wow. Man, we were about to leave, you know. He... Uh, had a great relationship with Harley Race. I loved him. He was he was he was a rare rare dude. That's why he loved wrestling for you and your company because he knew he was going to get really tremendous respect when it was all over. Wow. All right, listen, I'll tell you what. I love hearing these stories especially about the king of the ring. So, I'm sorry, but we're not going to make it we don't have time for anything else tonight. So th this has been an unbelievable ride. I said tonight, but this afternoon, whatever, whatever time you're listening, it doesn't matter. This has been unbelievable. So, so much history and conversation about one of the best NWA champions of all time. All right, Ron, you've gone far beyond just describing these four events. I felt like I was there in 1979 and even more respect for Harley race than ever. All right, folks, on Facebook, go to Ron Fuller Welch, the Tennessee stud. Like and follow him there to become a friend with a legend. On Twitter, same thing. Find him on Twitter, Ron Fuller Welch, and follow him there. His YouTube channel is Southeastern Rewind. Don't miss the second YouTube only Ask the Stud question and answer show starting Saturday, February 18th, 2023. Look for the post on Facebook and Twitter to leave your question for the next one. Check out the 11 new short rides with the stud exclusively on YouTube, a new one every other day. Now, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com is where you find everything that is the Tennessee stud. There are now 78 Southeastern, 23 Continental, and 12 Gulf Coast TV shows available, all in the order which they were recorded. 17 chapters of Ron's audio version of his best-selling Lion novel, Brutus, you'll find it all there. Over 50 stud stories are there. Six stars of the sport, four superstars of the past, Wendell Cooley, Mongolian Stomper, Dirty White Boy documentaries, and much more all there. All for only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year, plus the free one-week trial is still available. It is the best deal 
in wrestling. I tell you, so this this may have been the best stud cast so far, Ron. For you, this year of 1979 had more ups and downs than a roller coaster ride. Speaking of riding, what kind of ride are we in for next week? Well, man, if I'd only known, uh, Dave, what was coming in the rest of 1979 after a week like we just talked about, I would have sold both my wrestling territories right then. <laughs> That's kind of a year. <laughs> What's ahead, man? <laughs> so the Knoxville War hadn't even started yet, uh, uh, but the talent grab from Memphis was definitely underway. You know, Memphis was snatching away some of our best guys. And uh, so we're going to dive deep, man, into that talent grab next week. Uh, we're going to discuss another Memphis card that was loaded with southeastern wrestlers from both territories. Uh, we're going to talk about southeastern Knoxville that had another great card. Uh, we had lost the Japanese star to Memphis, but we gained one from the WWF New York territory hmm. uh, and uh, Knoxville's marching on, man. Uh, the Gulf coast had many more stars leaving than was coming, man. And it was about to experience for the first time since it rose from the ashes, man, in March of 1978 with the arrival of Southeastern, we lost momentum and we were going to experience a drop in business. And I was about to get for the first time as an owner, a wake-up call that was going to test me as a man. I hope everyone enjoyed this studcast, man, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you go out and tell your friends and neighbors about what we do here on a on a weekly basis, and please take care of yourself and others, and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at davidsummersproductions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud, LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic stud cast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.